Welcome to a Germs Journey News Desk, an international dialogue about the challenge of supporting community relevant public health communications. Find out more about a Germs Journey at our website, germsjourney.com, or find us on Twitter at Germs Journey. Hello, welcome to uh, Germs Journey News Desk, and I'm joined now, I'm Rob Watson, and I'm joined now by Rosie Parkin from Internews, who is a, a the Director of Impact. Hi, Rosie, how are you? Um, I'm great. And thanks for joining us today. Um, just tell us a little bit about what your role is, and why, why is Impact uh, an important part of what Internews does? That's a great question. So I, uh, this is a relatively newly created role. Um, we are an international uh, non-governmental organisation who provides support to media in 100 countries across the world. And when I, I say media, but we take a very broad definition of that, we are talking about whoever is the trusted information provider in a given community and context. It is often media, but it may also be social influencers, healthcare workers, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that we really want to understand is how the information that we're supporting is benefiting the community that it's intended to serve. But also we want to understand where it might be having negative impacts. And as you can imagine, this work has become increasingly complicated because we're operating in increasingly complicated information environments. And quite simply, it's it's really difficult to tell what was the single piece of information that made a difference to somebody. And when we're talking about, you know, COVID, what is the single piece of information that might have encouraged somebody to adopt preventive measures or encouraged somebody to believe that COVID is real or encourage them to, to you know, do various things that we might have required or needed them to do like covid has been the biggest sort of social coordination problem the world has ever seen and obviously communication and information play a massive role there and i think what's been really interesting in sort of being part of things unfolding not just observing this is the first time where we as a development organization have been um affected by the same issue as people in the countries in which we focus and work, albeit impacted very differently. We recognize that. I think the original kind of mantra about we're all in this together was quickly sort of <laughs> quickly proven wrong because we know that that you know we we this is impacting very differently in different places and being felt very differently. And and you know, this is this is really very relevant to the way that we communicate and provide information about this issue. But, but, you know, for the first time, what we were seeing was, <clears throat> for those of us who might have worked in health communication before, there has always been this, this kind of idea that, well, the, the sort of subtext to health communication, which is, well, you, te you tell people what to do, and of course they're going to do it because it's, it's good for them. And why wouldn't you prioritise uh, positive health-seeking behaviours? Why wouldn't you take your children to a primary healthcare facility if there were one available and if you saw the symptoms of a childhood illness? Well, people are rational and um, and the problem is lack of information and we need to we need to sort of fill that gap. But of course, we then experience that, um, you know, living in the UK, for example, having an abundance of information really at our disposal, um, it did not necessarily mean that everybody was willing to take the measures that might have been required or that epidemiologists were recommending or scientists were recommending or, or public health authorities. And so we really understand that, um, that there are particular sort of um, principles to information provision, which, um, which we need to sort of think about and adhere to, which I can sort of get to a bit later. One of the interesting you know, one of the issues that I think we've all experienced is that from the get go, there was a massive um, sort of um, uh, rush for people to get their hands on good quality information. And I think that was, you know, we felt that as information consumers living in, in sort of 
uh, vibrant information landscapes. It was like, can't get enough information about what's going on because there was so much unknown. And of course, you suddenly feel at risk and threatened and you want to understand what's going on sort of beyond your front door. And even more so, I think, as people have been under lockdown is this sense that you don't really know what the reality is out there because you can't see it for yourself. So the media partners that we work with saw this. I mean, it's others have said it better than me, but the demand for information increasing dramatically, but uh, the means of um, sort of funding that information provision reducing at the same time. So lots of our partners immediately kind of expressed concern about how they were going to sustain themselves financially through this period. In many cases, it was a kind of cash flow issue. But of course, for people who rely on advertising as the economy, as economies around the world were hit, advertisers stopped paying um you know we set up a rapid response fund which was really intended to, to help kind of key media outlets plug this funding gap so that they could continue to provide that really increasingly important information during this crisis and not have to worry for a temporary period about where the money to do that was going to come from um please interject if you have any questions no, no, you're, you're, you're kind of uh, answering all my questions as I go along, really, which is the, the I suppose the question I've got at this point is, is in, in terms of, you know, can we think about this in terms of any specific examples of places outside of the UK where this yeah. has been an issue? Yeah. And, and, and what, if you like, is the role of, you know, news and information uh, as almost as a, like public good, public yeah. service? Uh, it's it's kind of easy to it gets a lot you know the, it's easy to kind of think that we know what that is, but in practice it turns out to be something different maybe, and does that and, and different places it's applied in different ways. How do yeah. you manage that differential between those expectations? Yeah, so I suppose I mean I suppose one of the things to sort of talk about is what we saw when COVID hit and what our media partners were telling us about the new sets of pressures that they were experiencing. And whilst this is going to look slightly different in in different places, of course, there were some sort of key themes which immediately were immediately apparent. So um, a real challenge in reporting on a complex evolving story that's heavily technical, um, you know, simply journalists saying to us, we don't know how to report this story. And by the way, we can't leave our you know, we can't leave our houses, we're under lockdown now. So our usual ways of reporting are, um, are sort of don't exist for the moment. And also how do we, we're worried about um, the spread of COVID. We're worried about contracting it ourselves. How do we remain safe? Um, you know, what sort of support should we be expecting from the, the our employers? So a real kind of recognition that this story how of how big this story was how difficult it, it was to report when so many of the facts you know were yet to reveal themselves how do you report responsibly without um you know um instigating panic um and importantly how do you hold your government to account i mean the new challenge that i think all journalists face about the need to you know as is often the case in times of crisis that you want to hold the government response accountable. You you have to be asking questions about whether your authorities are doing the best they can or doing right by their citizens. And by the same token, you're also needing to inform those citizens about the different measures that they can be taking without causing alarm. So it's a real challenge. And of course, in lots of places, we saw that the authorities were very ready to use the um, the restrictions on movement, which were sort of necessary from a, or sanctioned from a public health perspective, applying those immediately to freedom of expression and freedom of information. So sort of ben at, at best benefiting from the fact that the normal sort of political processes, the normal venues at which people would conduct politics, protests that might normally happen, all those things being off the agenda for a while, you know, there is no question that some authorities found this useful um, because the sort of the light of scrutiny was was sort of dampened for a while. And in lots of places we saw a concern about um, misinformation being, you know, swiftly refashioned into fake news legislation 
whereby anybody who committed who criticised the government could be punished or prevented from doing so. We've seen that in so many places. We've seen that in Bangladesh with journalists being beaten up. We've seen that in Zimbabwe with Hopewell Chinono, quite a high profile case uh, of a journalist who was trying to report on corruption around um, medical supplies. He that has that has had an, has been arrested a number of times and, and spent a fair amount of this year in prison. Um, so authorities really using the opportunity to to crack down on freedom of expression. Um, I talked before about the running costs, about the, the sort of sustainability, about cash flow issues that media outlets were facing, which prevented them from from reporting not only prevented them from reporting, but for many was a kind of existential uh, crisis moment. Um, And some really well-known newspapers like the Mail and Guardian immediately started to feel the pinch. So this is a a long-standing outlet in South Africa, which immediately started talking to its audiences about, you know, unless you support us directly through this crisis period, we may, may no longer exist after this. Um, we had uh, increased requests and demand for digital security support um, from journalists who were either feeling um, the increased pressure or found themselves somehow with with the time to think about their digital security. But that was a that was an interesting kind of uptick in demand for that kind of service that we offer. Um, and obviously, the vast waves of misinformation and disinformation that have been circulating that. You know, interesting that interestingly, the WHO picked up very picked up on very early on and warned about very early on as a, the, an infodemic and the, the massive problem associated with um, high quality, accurate information being overwhelmed and competing with, you know, well, you'll have seen it all. I mean, I can't list all the crazy examples of, of mis and disinformation that we've seen swirling around, all kind of either intentionally designed or at least serving to to undermine trust and undermine this sense that this is an issue that we need to deal with collectively and absolutely capitalizing on um in some in some cases the sort of mistrust in government and authorities which might already have existed in lots of places <clears throat> and and of course in some cases being um fueled by those authorities themselves so you know there are a number of we know that there are a number of political figures who've absolutely been the original source of a lot of misinformation it sounds like the job of internews has been accelerated and intensified um and the need for you know if if this infodemic uh, a misinformation uh, uh challenge of it's deeply embedded in some of our political processes now around the world and nobody seems to be immune from it. And um, at the same time, it's built into our technical platforms and and, and our culture to, to a large extent. How, what's your thinking? So, okay, this is a very open question in terms of that. all of that said, what are the steps that you're thinking and planning through and discussing the interviews as to those first you know, kind of, I'm not saying what the big big picture answer is, but what are the first small steps that you think are essential to keeping some kind of grip on this? Because it's it could easily go out of control and we could easily become fatalistic about it and say, well, actually, it's just let it all go out of control because it needs to sort itself out and that destabilization might happen. What do we need to kind of bear in mind? Is it support for individuals? Is it support for specific top, you know, what, 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 what's the thinking behind that? So it's such a great question. And, and I really like the way you, you said that, that this has kind of accelerated uh, the work that we're doing anyway and has given it a sort of urgency, I guess. So are you asking about how we respond to mis- and disinformation? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, we're in, you know, we're, we're, still, um, we're still in the emergency phase. You know, anybody who thinks that, you know, for, from... That we're not out, you know, that everything's back to normal and we're all okay. We're not. We're still at the beginning of an emergency yeah. phase, really, because the next stage is that, you know, the rebuild and the reconfiguration and things like that. So, okay, well, what are the early lessons that we're picking up on as to what do we need to put in place? Yeah, you know, for example, um, organizations like Internews and uh, BBC World Service and similar organizations. How do they embed trust? Because they are still, you remain a trusted source of information. Do we need to go back and relook at that and say, what is that purpose of trust building? 
Such such a great question, and trust has obviously come up a lot. It's, it's central to the work that we're doing, and it's come up a lot this year. And one of the approaches that we take, uh, which I would like to see sort of uh, happen in more locations, but we have what's called an information ecosystem assessment, which allows us to understand from the audience's perspective who their trusted sources are. And as you would imagine, that differs from place to place and community to community. So in some places, you know, your health workers will be the most trusted sources of information. In other places, they they won't be. They may be pretty far down the list. And what we would, what we have argued consistently is you kind of need to know who those individuals and institutions are. And of course, media outlets will be in there as well, but they may not be the trusted source by any means. You need to know before a crisis hits who, who those sources are so that you can immediately sort of mobilise around them and support them. It's really, really difficult to build trust from nothing when a crisis starts. And I think something that we would love to develop, which is a real ambition, and I have no idea actually how we would go about this to begin with, but is to... We've, we've talked a lot about trying to monitor sort of levels of trust in institutions, levels of um, levels of vaccine confidence or vaccine hesitancy in different places. Like it should be possible kind of in this day and age to almost have a, a barometer um, across loads of different contexts, which allows you to say, OK, in country X, we can see that trust in institutions is very, very low. We can see that trust in vaccines is very, very low as a sort of baseline starting point, even before a crisis hits, even before we need to roll out, um, you know, vaccines at a global level, which allows you to say, OK, there are some hot spots that we, we can we can sort of tackle or invest some additional um, sort of energy or resources in from from the outset. But our, so our approach is to understand who these trusted sources are and then to support them specifically uh, and also to conduct kind of rumour tracking work, which will help us understand. And this is all done through local partners, which will help us understand what are the what are the most dangerous rumours which are circulating in the information ecosystem at any given time? What sort of existing cultural references or myths are they attached to? Why is it that they're so appealing? And if we needed to counter them with the correct information, how might that information be framed in order to resonate with the same sort of values and, and reference points? And that that's that make I make that sound very easy. It's obviously very, very difficult to do. And it's particularly difficult to do if if we're very late to the, the the game on this one and an organization called first draft to do some really good mis and disinformation work and um, have, identi- have identified what they call data uh, data deficits and what they argue quite compellingly is that you it should be possible to to sort of measure the gap between demand and supply in any environment and if you see, for example, that people are asking lots of questions about a particular vaccine, let's say, or um, a particular political local leader, or they're, they're asking questions, there's something that they want to know about, and the information that would respond to that is not available to them for whatever reason. Uh, it might be because the information provider doesn't know that that's what they're asking, or it might be that the government has decided to take this very blanket approach to communication which doesn't give anybody um, a the opportunity to kind of raise their hand and say, I didn't understand what you said about that, or how does that apply to me? Um, so, so kind of understanding where those gaps exist, those data deficits exist, and, and, and trying to respond to them before misinformation kind of seeps into that, into that gap and becomes lodged there. That that's really important. Um, we've obviously applied principles that I guess we already adhere to around different, the most effective way of communicating in in a crisis like this, which I would just share. They won't come as news to anybody. I don't, well, I say they won't come as news. They're they're completely like, to me, they're total common sense. It's what I've lived and breathed for 15 years. And yet when I saw the UK government's communication response, I was like, oh, right, this is not, this is not a universal set of principles but you know we learned from the Ebola crisis that it was so important that information or health advice and guidance be 
locally relevant and appropriate. And we we know that at the early stages of the response in West Africa, there was a real disconnect between what international health agencies were saying needed to happen in order to to minimize um, transmission of Ebola um, and what local people, you know, of course, were willing to do. And there was a big issue around burials um, that once people sort of cottoned on or responders cottoned on to the fact that this was we had to find a way to convey uh, accurate sort of health information in a way that allowed people to discuss it and to think about it and to kind of say, okay, so so that's what you need me to do, but I can't do that in my community. We just don't do that. So what could we do that might be our, our way of responding and kind of adopting that particular sort of health advice, but in a way that's completely sort of locally locally appropriate, relevant, doable, um, accepted, acceptable. That's That's been really important. And I've seen a lot of, um, I guess, there's been a lot of focus again on social marketing, kind of at the beginning of this, this kind of age old, like, hey, why don't, why don't we use advertising agencies to convince people that, you know, they should do X, Y, Z. They, those guys are good at that. Why don't we get them to do it again? And you know, I don't. I don't know how successful or not campaigns like that have been. I will. I, I appreciate that there are influencers that people listen to, and you know, we can we can we we can assume that sort of it's been important for people that are listened to to, for example, show that they're accepting the vaccine, but perhaps there is some some element of that. But what social marketing doesn't do is allow people to respond uh, and to sort of work with that information and to think about it and to discuss it. Um, and I, I was surprised, I guess, to see that that is still, those lessons haven't been learned. Um, f- f- final question for you, because... Um... Oh, sorry. No, no. It's, I mean, th- this is the great thing about these things. It's kind of it opens up so many. There are other, definitely other conversations that we will follow on with this with. I think I, I've, I've picked out kind of two two things. It's like the difference between a communications process that is information led and a communications process that is values led, that local relevance, cultural relevance, those kind of things. What would you say? How could you? sum that up as in terms of thinking about the impact of communications we we have to do both i would argue well i was just about to say we have to do both and i think that the the art if you like and the science and what is really challenging is to um understand exactly the right um proportion of the values which i would also i mean i know kind of emotions um, are that's different. Um, those are slightly different things. There are different ingredients there. There are different elements to that. But if fundamentally, kind of w- what is going to engage somebody, what is going to make them trust a the piece of information, frankly, what is going to um, ensure that that piece of information travels faster and more effectively than misinformation and disinformation, which is often packaged in a, in a kind of similarly emotive or emotionally engaging way, which is what makes it so much more kind of popular. Um, But you have to have a kind of kernel, you have to have the the factual element has to be in place. Um, And we've seen, I guess we ran a study in Bolivia recently, which was very instructive because we were working with journalists to support them to put out sort of really super factual, high quality information. And audiences could tell that it was really high quality information and they kind of trusted it, but they didn't share it. Um, and, and maybe we need to do more to in sort of encourage people to kind of be proud of sharing high quality information like that. Is, that, it, that in itself becomes a value that people want to associate with. Well, we're not there yet, but it was it was really interesting because people would say, "Yeah, I can see it's a great piece, and I can I can see it's entirely trustworthy, and I I can believe what's written in it, but I'm not going to share it with anyone." Which is well, we we we've got our work cut out, haven't we? I think that just shows. I mean, you know, if anything comes out of the the Germs Journey project, it's that idea of kind of co creation, co development, thinking through the multi dimensionality of this process, and not thinking it's just a very 
transactional systems type approach. We have to think on these different levels. Rosie, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we will share uh, links to Internews and uh, some of the projects that you talked about uh, through Twitter and on the website when we share the video and the audio. And thank you so much, Rob. It's been a real treat to chat to you. following a germs journey an international dialogue about the challenge of supporting community relevant public health communications you can find us on twitter at germs journey or go to our website germsjourney.com